Hi, I'm Michael. This is Lessons from the Screenplay. No film frightens me like The Shining. Other movies may have moments that make me jump more, or keep me in more suspense about the character's survival, but The Shining disturbs me, hypnotizes me, makes me look over my shoulder, suddenly feeling like there is someone or something in the room with me. Today, I want to look at how co-writers Stanley Kubrick and Diane Johnson approached writing the film. What they did to set it apart from the conventional horror films of the time, and figure out what exactly is so creepy about The Shining. I should begin by saying that I wasn't able to read the shooting script of The Shining. The only version available is a post-production screenplay, essentially a transcript of the film. After much googling and tweeting at Lee Unkrich, director of Toy Story 3 and caretaker of the website TheOverlookHotel.com, it was confirmed that the only shooting scripts available are far from where I live. But from my research, I've learned that the screenplay was being written during pre-production. Co-writer Diane Johnson said she even toured the sets to figure out the stagings of scenes for the script. In fact, rewrites happened all the way through filming. I quit using my script. I just take the ones they type up each day. This may be partly why it's so hard to find an official shooting script. But Kubrick also wasn't a fan of publishing the screenplays for his films, stating, A screenplay isn't meant to be read. It's to be realized on film. Regardless, in the case of The Shining, the words of the script and the design of the film were created together. And luckily, there is a lot of documentation on the writing process. So, what was the writing process? According to Johnson, Stanley's approach was to think in terms of time segments in relation to the totality of the film. There ended up being 10 segments in the movie, each marked with a title card. In the beginning of the film, the titles refer to the subjects of each section. But as the film moves on, the time intervals increase, from a month later to days of the week, to specific times on the final day at the Overlook Hotel. The increasing passage of time helps create momentum and suspense for the audience. We know we're getting closer to whatever inevitable horror awaits, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. In an effort to understand why The Shining affects me in a deep, psychological way, I was on the lookout for differences from other horror films. One thing that stood out to me was its setup. It directly indicates the dangers to come early on. Rather than giving the audience reasons to doubt that Jack would ever hurt his family, we're immediately told that he's an alcoholic who has injured Danny before. My husband just used too much strength and he injured Danny's arm. We're even told in one of the first scenes that a previous caretaker went crazy and murdered his family with an axe, the very thing that Jack will try to do. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not gonna happen with me. The film gives us every reason to suspect and dislike Jack. But what I always find most surprising is how early the supernatural elements are revealed and explained. You know, some places are like people. Some shine, and some don't. All of this removes a lot of the potential mystery of the story, because the audience is essentially told what's going to happen. But the point is that the frightening part of the story isn't what's going to happen, it's how it's going to happen. From the beginning, Kubrick didn't want to make a conventional horror film, instead aiming to hold themselves to a higher standard. Johnson said, It must be plausible, use no cheap tricks, have no holes in the plot, no failures of motivation, it must be completely scary. Which brings us to the thing that disturbs me most about The Shining. It's creepy. What is the difference between creepiness and other kinds of fear? In a study published in 2013 by Francis T. McAndrew and Sarah S. Conkey, they state, Creepiness is anxiety aroused by the ambiguity of whether there is something to fear or not, and or by the ambiguity of the precise nature of the threat. 
An example of this is a popular theory which argues that masks are disturbing for the same reasons. When someone is wearing a mask, you're unable to discern if the person underneath is a threat to you. Their intentions are ambiguous and unknowable. I think this is why I find the two little girls so frightening. When they appear, they're at a distance that makes it difficult to read their faces. Hello, Danny. And even when you can, they're completely expressionless. Their presence indicates they want something from you, but they are perfectly still and their faces betray nothing. That same study on creepiness also offers the following example. If you're walking down a dark city street and you hear something move in an alley to your right, your brain will first respond as if it is someone or something that intends to do you harm. Even if it ends up being a gust of wind knocking over a bottle, evolutionarily we're programmed to assume danger in ambiguous situations. Hello? The filmmaking in The Shining activates these same primal reactions in a few ways. The music is unsettling and unpredictable, at times startling when nothing has happened, and other times unresponsive despite visual changes. It signals to the audience to constantly be on guard. It's the noise we hear down the alley that makes us assume danger is present. But visually, the hotel is inviting. It's brightly lit with seemingly natural light, not at all a stereotypical horror environment. This adds to the unease. The overlook hides the horror that resides beneath its exterior, like it's wearing a mask. Perhaps my favorite example of creepiness is when Danny is playing with his toys. After a few moments, a ball rolls up to him. And when he looks up to see where it came from, he sees only an empty hallway. In and of itself, a ball being rolled is not scary. But once again, the ambiguity is unsettling. Who rolled it? What do they want? As Danny walks down the hallway, he finds the door to room 237 cracked open. The room he was warned to stay out of. Stay out. You understand? Stay out. But instead of being dark and foreboding, it's luminous and almost welcoming. The clash of these two things, implied danger yet no obvious threat, creates unease. It's not clear how one should react. The flip side of this is why The Shining actually gets less scary for me toward the end. Or rather, it becomes a different kind of scary. The more the film reveals the boundaries and intentions of the Overlook Hotel and the spirits who reside there, the less vague the threat. I fear you will have to deal with this matter in the harshest possible way, Mr. Thomas. Once Jack is committed to killing his family, the proper reaction is clear. By the end, it's simply a crazed man with an axe chasing his family. More suspenseful than creepy. The Shining is a great example of how film can access and manipulate the psyche of an audience. Kubrick and co-writer Diane Johnson show that the most powerful kind of fear doesn't come from a monster on the screen but from within our own imaginations. Kubrick demonstrates how great filmmaking can activate our primal fears while telling a deceptively simple story. After all, as Kubrick described it, it's just the story of one man's family quietly going insane together. <laughs>Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. The Shining really does creep me out and I've had trouble sleeping the past couple weeks because I keep picturing the twins like standing at the foot of my bed watching me. It's not fun. Thanks to my friend Ryan McDuffie who when I asked, do you have any resources about Kubrick? Gave me all of this. There are many things. There's a great Vsauce video about what makes things creepy that was a very big resource for me. So a link to that is also in the description. And finally, 100,000 subscribers. 
That's insane. That's the population of my hometown times three, at least. Uh, so that's crazy. So thank you so much to everyone who subscribes. Thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. And most of all, thank you for watching.